And uh, I know that some of the things that I might be saying, many of us may not completely agree with it. But this is the word of God. And I am trusting God that some of the things that we don't completely agree with, the Lord, the Spirit of God will bring conviction that will make us understand and embrace the will and the purpose of God for families and marriages. And as we do, great will be the blessing to every marriage in Jesus' name. I said, blessed will be the blessing to our marriages in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. For how you have led us this far this year. We thank you for how you are building us in our most holy faith. How you are equipping us for the challenges that the world and the society is throwing at us. We thank you because your word will never fail. It is the solution we need to every challenge we face, both in our spiritual and in our marital life. And Lord, even as we are gathered this morning, we pray you will shine the light and you will reveal the truth to each and every one of us in Jesus' name where there has been conflict and we've been finding a way of resolving that conflict in our marriages this morning we pray that solutions will come from heaven in Jesus name spirit of the living God have your way here and let your name be glorified we thank you Lord because we know you have answered in Jesus mighty name we pray and the church says this morning I'm talking to you on the Christian and an unbelieving spouse you say you are a Christian and maybe your wife is not born again you say you are a Christian and maybe your husband professing to be born again is struggling and you can't see the fruits of him being born again or her being born again in her life there is a solution from the word of God and that's what we are looking at this morning turn with me as we read in 1 Peter chapter 3 in 1 Peter chapter 3 I'm going to be reading verses 1 and 2 likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word they also may without the word be won, be conquered, be persuaded by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. This passage I have read to you was the, or is the counsel of Peter the Apostle to a peculiar situation that was evident in the church in his day. He wrote unto the church and he said, Wives, I have a counsel from the Lord for you. I have an advice from the Lord for to you that if first of all you should be in subjection to your husbands that if any husband obey not the word this same husband they also may without the word my husband doesn't know the bible he doesn't read the bible he can't be bothered 
with what God, the word of God says the Bible says you can still win that husband you can still win that wife to the Lord not necessarily reading the Bible to the husband or to the wife but by your own conversation by your own lifestyle by your own conduct but let me begin as we define marriage because in days gone by in centuries and decades gone by we didn't have to define marriage there was no need because everybody knew what marriage is all about what family is all about in many societies and in many cultures they already understand what marriage is that it's a union between a man and a woman when they come together and they are joined together we said yes a family has started that was something that everybody knew about that was the definition of the world at large back in many days many years ago that is changing now in the church our own definition as Christians goes beyond just a man and a woman being joined together the church will tell you that we define marriage as a union between man and a woman by the will and the word of God I mean you are joining them together by the will and the word of God in only matrimony it's important because our definition is not a secular definition the secular definition in days gone by is a man and a woman when they come back when they come together and they are joined a family is giving birth to but the church it has always been a man and a woman all right we agree with that when they are joined together by the will and the word of god beyond that in only matrimony the bible says marriage is honorable in all with the bed on the fire so matrimony must be holy and these two people after they have been joined together by the will and the word of god in only matrimony we live together till death do them part that is the definition bible definition of marriage in other words a, a marriage is between a male and a female the man is the male the woman is the female you bring them together and they join together it's not other definitions or practices that we have seen in the world in the world today they tell you a man and a man can come together and get married they tell you a woman and a woman can come together and get married they said in fact your husband can be a woman a woman will not be my husband I don't know about you a man will not be my wife that is the Bible and I need to define it clearly because this is the Word of God in our contemporary time you will find people define family and marriages in different forms in fact it is not just polygamy that we are you know dealing with now there is also polyandry in other words polygamy is a, a situation where a man takes more than two women and he takes them as wife but polyandry is a situation where one woman takes three men and they are all living with her as a husband you can see how it has changed but the word of God is clear for us the marriage and family is birth between a man and a woman a male and a female in only matrimony and these two they live together we don't believe in divorce and separation 
We don't believe in a situation that we say, okay, yes, we are married, but I am living in Jamaica and my wife is living in the UK. That is the marriage that is faulty. That is the marriage that is not according to the perfect will of God. Marriage is when a man and woman come together and they live together for as long as life endures. And I pray that we will come back to the Bible definition of marriage. And the Lord will help us to do that in Jesus' name. When we do that, the family is giving birth to. And for any church that wants to build for Christ, for any church that wants to do ministry in the light of eternity, they must of necessity uphold these values, this teaching. Otherwise, eternity will tell. Because you will find churches these days where the you know, pastor says he is gay and he's gathering lots of other gays and lesbians and they are all doing their things and they say they are doing church. You will find, you know, pastors these days that are joining a woman and a woman together. You will find spiritual and Christian counselors today that are saying, well, God loves these people. God loves them. We have no problem with that. But that is not the definition of marriage by, according to Bible standard. So we as a church, we need to not just preach it. We need to uphold that teaching. We need to emphasize it. That we don't encourage divorce. For every problem that marriages may suffer, there is a solution from the word of God. And I pray that even today, the Lord will bring us to that understanding, to that knowledge, and to that conviction in Jesus' name. Amen. When these two people are joined together, there will always be differences. Two people that are coming from different cultural, educational, socioeconomic background will by all means have differences but for us as Christians whatever differences we have we must align them with the word of God that is the only time when marriages work if you are coming from a different cultural background and you are coming from a different you know outlook of the world you are coming from a different you know perception when it comes to money management in the family and you bring that into the marriage the first thing you want to do is to sit down and ask yourself this view that I have about culture about money about relationship how do they align with the word of God in other words your wife is bringing a view you are bringing your view and you are putting it before the word of God you take the Bible and you use it to filter the one that negates the word of God you take it you throw it in the bin it doesn't matter how long you have lived with that view the one that contradicts the word of God, any perception, any values that you have, any you know, view that you, you, you hold, when they negate or contradict the word of God, the duty of a Christian is to take it and put it in the being. For instance, maybe when you were growing up, your parents had told you as a woman, and they told you, listen, oh, my daughter, I have been married to your father for 50 years. <laughs> there are things that I still do that he 
doesn't know about it. He will never know about it. That is not the Bible. And you have lived with that. And she has taught you to also make sure that you don't tell men everything. Be careful what you tell men. In fact, there are secrets that your husband will never know till you die. You can tell me. If I'm dead, you can keep it to yourself. But you must, that is not the Bible. When you come into a marriage, as a Christian, you take that one, you drop it in the bin. That this one contradicts the word of God. Maybe you are the man. And growing up, your parents, your father had told you that listen, you are the man in the house. The women, they are substandard. They are low to you. There there are things that you will never, never share with your husband. In fact, I have heard a man said to me once, that as a man his wife will never touch his head and I said what is that? why is that? he said ah it's against our culture I said really? why is that against your culture? ah you don't understand I am from so 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 parts and for us women as far as they are concerned they are defiled they must not touch their hair because they take the glory of the man away and he has lived with that all his life. Even in that marriage that he is presently in. That contradicts the word of God. He is not a member of our church. If he was, I would have told him. But yet, I still told him that that is what your culture teaches. But have you used that thing that your culture teaches to compare with the word of God? Ah, no, no, no. Bible is Bible. Leave Bible aside. Culture is culture. Leave our culture aside. I know that many times people are so much attached to traditions and to culture. But brethren, if our marriage is going to survive, we must align everything with the word of God. When they contradict when they don't stand the test of God's word, then we need to abandon them. And as we do, I pray there will be fellowship and there will be blessing in the family in Jesus' name. Amen. But what happens? We've been talking about you know, Christian marriages now. What happens in a situation if one of the couple now will not obey the word of God. Oh, it is a lot easier when two people are born again. They are children of God. And they are willing to do the will of God. That when there is a problem in the family, they will sit down and what does the Bible say? And they look at what the Bible says and they both agree that, oh, if the Bible says this, then what the Bible says is what we will do. But what happens in a situation where your spouse can't be bothered about what the Bible says. What happens in a situation where, where even when your husband or your wife is on the other side of the fence and every time you tell the, 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 your spouse God will not have us do this kind of thing or the kind of influence or the kind of place you have given to your, your parents in this relationship that is not what God will have and he cannot be bothered he cannot be perturbed about that he can just no no no, no that is for your church that is if that individual is an unbeliever how do you deal with that situation the passage I have read to you this morning deals with that and also provides an answer. The contrary scenario is what our text reveals to us this morning. And in this peculiar situation, there are two reasons that can be responsible when you have two people that are living together as man and wife and one will not obey the word. The first reason, or the first case can be, maybe they both got married as an unbeliever. And in the process of time, one of them 
got born again and was one to the Lord. Why the other one is, you know, we are still believing God for the salvation. And this one that is born again, being the woman, is coming back home and telling the husband, my husband, this is what the Bible says. The husband will say, forget about that. Ah, look at you. Now, now you can preach to me. You have forgotten that we used to drink beer together. We used to go to the club together. We used to do evil together. Now you now can now be a preacher to me. And the individual will not listen. When that is the situation in the family, it becomes problematic in that marriage. But yet God here is providing an answer. The other scenario can be in a situation where this both, you know, this couple were have been married and they married as a Christian. In fact, they got married in a Bible believing church and they both believed the Bible and they were living by the dictates of the Bible. But somewhere along the line, maybe the husband, you know, fall and completely, you know, away, went into backsliding and apostasy. And it was so serious. And the man would say, no, 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 I believe that, all that rubbish before. I don't, I don't, I don't, don't. come on, don't preach for, for me. I used to believe all that lies. If, yeah, one man, one woman. If I want to marry another woman, I will marry another woman. When that is the case, how do you deal with it? And here the word of God is telling us that women, wives, be in subjection to your own husband. The reason is because even when that man will not obey, God wants to use your own life to change that woman. And I am trusting God this morning that when or if that is your situation, peculiar, that though both of you, you are professing to be born again, but you look at your husband and you are saying that my husband is not living like a Christian. This morning, the wisdom for you to win back your husband unto the Lord. The Lord will grant unto each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Such family situations also occurred in Bible days. And here, the apostle describes that situation. What can the family or the partner do to bring that spouse to genuine conversion is the subject of our conversation this morning. There is an husband, a wife that has been separated from Christ. How do you win that individual back to the Lord without necessarily contemplating divorce? You see, to divorce is the easiest way out of marriage. In fact, it is the weakest of men that divorce. It is the weakest of women that the first thing they think of when there is a problem in marriage is that, oh yes, I'm ready to go. After all, you are not the only man in the world. It shows you are not strong. You are not tough enough for that challenge. But if you are strong, you are tough. You will stay there and see it through. Because there is solution for every marital problem. Nobody throws his car away at one instant of problem. You bought a car and you've been driving the car and you are enjoying the car and the car never disappoints you. You know, you, uh, in summer, you put on the AC. The AC is cold and chilly and you drive it around in comfort. In winter, you sit the heater on. It is warm. And the, once you start the engine in the morning, it's always there. Only for the car to have problem. And you say, eh? This car. I want to use you as I have always been using you and you are disappointed. I won't touch you again. I will throw you away. Who does that? Nobody. Nobody does that. And it is the same with marriage. And I am trusting God that the grace for us to keep our testimony so that our own marriages will not end like so many other marriages that we are hearing that are falling apart around us. I pray the Lord will give us that grace in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a God-given solution to every problems in our families. And this morning, 
the Lord will grant it unto us in Jesus' name. Come with me to the first point. As we look at the character of an unbelieving spouse. As you read that passage, the Bible describes the unbelieving or the backsliding husband as a man that obey not the world. Can you see that? In Peter, First Peter chapter 3. I'm reading the end from verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word. As you look at a man that does not obey the word, what do you see in the life of that man? You find a man that is living in defiance. He can't be bothered. You, there's nothing you tell him that he will listen. He pushes his aside. Oh, my husband, look at what the word of God says. Oh, forget about that, that one. Oh, so now you want to preach to me. I, I'm, not, I'm not for that, please. You find a man that is living in disobedience. He knows. Because he was once maybe born again. And he knew the truth about the word of God. He knew what the standard of God is when it comes to marriage. That you don't, you don't have, you don't live in marriage and still commit adultery. You don't live in marriage and still have conversation with other women that your wife must not know about. You don't live in marriage and you know there are relationships that no, no, no. He, he knows, but yet he will not listen. He is just living in disobedience. You look at a man that will not obey the word. He's a man that is deluded, completely far from reality. Like Saul. The Bible tells us the story of Saul. In 1 Samuel, you come there to chapter uh, 20. And the Bible says, chapter 15 rather, the Bible says the word of the Lord came to that individual and told him, this and this is what I want you to do. The instructions were clear. He knew what God required of him. But then he went and he did contrary to the will of God. When Samuel came and was asking him, he said, in fact, everything that the Lord said I have done. Are you deceiving yourself or you are deceiving God? Far from the reality. A deluded man. And sometimes some of our men, that's the way they live. They think, oh, as far as I am concerned, I am all right. That's your interpretation of that passage of the Bible. That is not my own interpretation. The wife is saying, my husband, look at the word of God now. Look, oh, that is how you want to interpret it. You can apply the Bible whatever way you like. But you know the standard. You know what the word of God says. But you will not do it. Obviously, the apostle here was referring to those who have been exposed to the preaching of the gospel, but who have not yielded their lives. Every time you find people like that, and some husbands are like so. Come with me to First Samuel chapter fifteen. Quickly, let me sh- read that passage on to you. In First Samuel chapter fifteen, let me read first in verse thirteen. Look at what the Bible says. And Samuel came to Saul and said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. <laughs> Can you imagine? You have performed what you wanted to do, not the commandment of the Lord. Come, look at verse 19. And this individual looked at him. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice upon the spoil? And did evil in the sight of the Lord. And now, in verse 20, look at his brokenness. And Saul said unto Simon, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have gone, he said, he said Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and I have bought, and I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. He wanted to do what he, he said, Yes, I have done what God wanted me to do, but I have done other things. At least I have not divorced you, my wife. I'm only marrying another one to join you. Okay, the church said we should not divorce. Okay, I won't divorce you, but I will marry a second one and join you. I have not completely disobeyed the Lord. Sometimes that's how we do. But God is asking, He's telling us 
Now, when you are in that situation, it's a peculiar situation. But do you know, it's not a time for you now to fight. It's not, it's not the time for you to fret. It's not the time for you to be forceful. Because all those will not win the day. The wisdom we need to be able to win a backsliding or unconverted spouse is documented in the word of God. And as we obey, the Lord will bring back our husbands in Jesus' name. Such unconverted men, they are carnal and are often difficult to deal with. Their wives' desire is that they will be converted as soon as possible. And when that happens in the family, the natural approach to such kind of situation is for the woman to say, well, I have done everything I know how to do. I have done everything. I have spoken to this, my husband. I have prayed. And now he's not going to have his easy anymore. That is the natural propensity in man. It can be the wife, or it can be the husband. And they want to fight that if he does not have peace in this house, he will follow me to church. If I turn my back on him, he will follow me to church. If he does not see my face on the ground again, and all the care that I used to give him, if he doesn't see it anymore, he will, he will, he will listen to me. My sister does also doesn't work. The Lord has provided us with solution. Winning any backsliding spouse will take faith. That's the number one thing. Faith in you believing God for the grace, same grace that worked in your life, that that grace also will work in the life of that spouse. The man, oh, you are, you are living by the grace of God, in obedience to the word of God, thank God for it. But now you want to believe God. You want to tell God that, oh God, if your grace was not in vain in my life, let it not be in, the, in vain in the life of my spouse too. So the number one thing you need is faith and not fight. The number two thing you need is forbearance. Forbearance. You understand that between the time you are praying and the time that God will win that man, you need to endure. Endurance without complaint. Endurance without nagging. Endurance without telling his stories all over the place. There are some things on, on the, online now where you know, a woman has been telling you know, stories about the husband, the husband too telling stories about her confusion all over the place while you are believing God for God to change your husband you are forbearing you are forbearing without compromise oh I will endure I will endure but eh, when I get to my breaking point no, no, when you say that the devil is listening and he will push you to that breaking point but when you make up your mind I won't give up on my husband I know that this man is God's will for my life. I prayed concerning this man. And now he's gone wayward. Uh, oh, maybe you even never prayed. Oh, I know myself and my husband we were both sinners before. And you saved me, God. Won't you save my husband? I know you will do it. And you are forbearing. You are not forcing. You are not fretting. You know, many people will fret. And they will, they, they will escalate the problem. The number three thing you need is forgiveness. It's very important that even before, oh, you already know that this my spouse is not born again. So even before he even does his foolishness and he does what he's going to do, you already make up your mind. There is no limit to the forgiveness that I'm going to forgive this man as long as he is still a sinner. And it's important. That you understand all these conversations, this character that you need to possess, so that your life can win your husband back to the Lord. Beyond that, you need faithfulness. Faithfulness. 
In the sense that you are not saying that, okay, my husband knows how to <laughs> be, uh, take, take care of himself. The, whole, the only thing the person he thinks about is, in, is, in, is himself. I will tell him that I know what he knows. Oh, my husband is, is cheating. I will tell him that, hey, women are good at this thing more than men. No, you don't need to show him anything. You have your life to keep. You have your salvation to guide. Don't show him. You don't need to show him anything. While you are believing God, you are still faithful. You are, you are faithful. Don't put uh, rat poison in his food and think that, okay, if this man is going to live like this, then let me, let me just show him that he's not wise. As I'm still cooking his food and he's doing all these things, I will teach him a lesson. Don't teach him any lesson. And also, you must not turn your back. Let there be fellowship. Don't want to sleep at night and you turn your back on your husband. Don't stop talking. Oh, I me, mean, I know. God, I'm praying. But this man, I don't even think I can even talk to this man. Let him just... No, 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 no. There's no way you can win somebody that you are not talking to. There's no way there can be reconciliation and peace. You are still communicating. God is expecting you to encourage him. God is expecting you to show him love. God is expecting you... Uh, but you, you, don't, you don't cut off fellowship. Fellowship must still continue. I once told you the story of those couples when they were not on talking terms. And one of them had an important interview. And because they have made up their minds that they were not going to talk to each other, the husband had no job. It was the wife that has been working or so. And the husband had an important interview the next day. But because he's so strong and he said, I'm not going to talk to my wife, what he did was he wrote a, a piece of uh, paper, a note, where, please wake me up at 5 o'clock. And he will not verbally tell the wife because he has made up his mind not to talk to the wife. The wife is the one that gets up early every time. She's a healthy person. So he, he took that note and put it by the side of the uh, bed of the wife. So eventually, after the wife, and he slept. And the, uh, uh, when the wife had finished all the things to do in the house, she came to the bed and saw the note. And he said, okay, he read the note. He, this man saw the wife before he went to bed, but he would not talk to the wife about it. What stops you? My husband, my wife, I have an interview. Wake me up at 5 so that I can prepare. If not, please wake me up at 5 o'clock and leave the note here. No problem. The wife came to bed that night and he saw the note. She read it. She put it down back and she slept. At 5 o'clock in the morning, she woke up. She wrote, it is 5 o'clock, get up. And she put it by the side of the man. The man got up eventually and looked at the time. And he looked at the time. It was past 6. And he looked at the note. Ah, isn't she that I told you to wake me up at 5 o'clock? The wife said, didn't you see that I woke you up at 5 o'clock? You told me by note to wake you up at 5 o'clock. I woke you up also by note. Just because they decided there would not be fellowship. That is foolishness. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And it's important that as we look at all these things that the Lord is teaching us, this description or the characteristic that these men, they obey not the world, it shows that the heart of the man has become hardened. A man that will not obey the word of God. Is it your word that he will obey? What makes you think that you are stronger than God? What makes you think that that man fears you more than he reverends God? So you need the help of God. These men, they make themselves deaf to the inspired word of God and also neglect every message from God's minister. They dis disregard the good counsel of the Christian wife. And generally, such men, they don't listen to the preaching. It is always like that. Such kind of men, they don't generally listen to the preaching, to the prophecy, or to the pastoring of their wife. They think, please go, what do you know? Maybe some, some, sometimes it's the man that even brought the woman to the Lord. You say, I've been a Christian. And sometimes they deceive themselves. They say that, you think you are the only one that will go to heaven. Look at, you see, that heaven, I will get there before you. Me, I will get there before you. And they are deceiving themselves. They know they are not living right. But they will never listen 
to the preaching, to the prophecy, to the when the wife comes back and they say, My husband, I I I I I dreamt and I saw something evil is intended against this family. Please let that say, please go. You are always seeing. Hey, look at Joseph. You are always dreaming in the house. They don't take it seriously. So don't sometimes to do the things that normally we do, we are, they are not as you know productive. And I'm trusting God that the wisdom in the word of God this very morning, it will provide a solution to these problems in Jesus' name. Such an individual, he will position himself. The unbelieving spouse I'm talking about will position himself in a state that a man cannot speak to him. He might, he might be, have received the misleading advice of a sinful mother. So other times, it is because of the corrupting influence of some ungodly friends. And he will say, as far as I am concerned, this is what my mother has taught me. And you can't tell me that you are wiser than my mother. You can't tell me that I, I will leave what my mother has told me and I will come and obey your own. In fact, some men will tell you that as long as they are alive, their mother will always be number one in their life. Their wife, if they discuss anything with you now as the wife, and you both of you have come to conclusion. When they got up and we went away, they are going to their mother. Mama, come and sit down. What is it? Me and my wife, we discussed last night. This and this and this is what we have decided to do. And uh, um, uh, I just said I should, you know, hear your take on the matter. And the woman will say, ah, these women of these nowadays, they are so crafty. Is that what your wife said you should do? Don't do it. Come and do it this way. And the man said, that's why I thank God for your life. You will never die. You will live long. And he goes back home. And he calls the wife. All those things that we talked about in the being. Ah, but why? My mother said no. As far as they are concerned, the counsel of their mother comes first. The counsel of their ungodly friends comes first. And when you find such kind of men, the Bible is saying, don't expect anything less from the character of a non-believing spouse. It is just normal. That's what you should. So there should be no such thing as surprise when you find a man living like that. Don't worry yourself about it. Do what the Bible says. And the Lord will give you victory in Jesus' name. Amen. That brings me to the second point quickly. The conduct of an uncompromising saint. We have looked at the character of an unbelieving spouse. Here, yeah, wives who suffer from husbands that obey not the word often think of not submitting at home as commanded in the scriptures. That's what comes to us generally. Naturally, when you see that this man is living like this, you will say, okay, eh, to your tent to Israel. Say he knows how to be rebellious. I will teach him that there is no peace, especially in this part of the world. That is what is causing many breakups and divorces in this nation. I will tell him that women have power. He, we are not in Africa. I will let him know this, that all those things that he did when we were in Africa now... I will pay him back in his coin right now that we are here. In fact, I've been listening to other women and the things they have been doing to their husband. I've not done one third of it to you. By the time I finish dealing with you, that is the natural thing that a woman, but God is saying that, nah, no, that should not be your conduct. The temptation to retaliate and rebel against such husband comes, and sometimes it comes very strong. You're almost irresistible. Reacting carnally to an unconverted or com uh, backsliding husband or wife is contrary to the spirit that dwells in true believers. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, look at the word of God. As I read here from verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. Can you, can you see that? First Peter chapter 3 said it. Submit yourself unto your husband. Here Paul again writing to the Ephesians. He said look oh, let me tell you. This is the total revelation of God's word. Wise. 
submit yourselves unto your own husband not as unto just your husband but as unto the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body therefore as the church is subject unto Christ so let the wife be to their own husbands in everything in everything oh I will submit myself to my husband <laughs> but when it comes to money <laughs> he will keep his money I will keep any other thing he tells me I will be I have no problem with that but when it comes to money no 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 let him keep his money let him keep. in everything oh I will submit to my husband as long as he does not negate what my parents already told me but when it comes in conflict submission with what no 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 the Bible says, in everything. You are coming back, you are saying, okay, this is the way it is. My husband, this is what has happened. This is the money. This is everything. You can't be bothered. What is money? Up till today, in many marriages, in many churches, Christian assemblies, you will still find families that have separate accounts. The husband has his own account. The wife has his own account. Everybody account for their money. Everybody brings their own share of the bill. Okay, how much is the bill this month? He said it's 200. Very good. Uh, the equation is straightforward. Um, 100 for you, 100 for me. The following month, how much is the bill this morning? Is 120, uh, 100 pounds, 20 pence. Okay, this is my 50 pence and 10, 50 pounds and 10 pence. So every pence they divide it evenly. No cheating. It's a shame. And on Sunday in church, oh, we are together again. Just praising the Lord. And the devil is looking at us and he's laughing. The devil will not laugh at you. And it's important, brethren, that God is speaking to us that our marriages can be better. Our homes can be glorious. Our children can grow up in an environment where there is unity, there is love, there is progress. Because we are matching resources, strength, everything together. And I pray the Lord will do it in Jesus' name. The Spirit of God is clear in his teaching, even if any husband does not obey the word, the wife is to be in subjection to her own husband. Many times you will find it like that. Sometimes your husband is a drunkard. He drinks a lot. And when he drinks, he misbehaves. That's not the time for you to be disrespectful. It's not a reason. And you will find it also, even in the Old Testament, in the life of a woman called Abigail. Come with me to 1 Samuel chapter 25. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, let me read from Let me read verse Let me read verse 17 Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do for evil is determined against our master and against all his household for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him this was the information that came to Abigail the wife of Nabal after what he did to David and they came and they said we know your husband is a man that will not believe anything we tell him your husband is a very reckless man he can't be bothered so, but let us let you know this is the evil that is intended that they are going to deal with your husband. David at purpose is going to kill your husband and wipe your household completely. So, you better know what you will do. That information came to Abigail. When a woman has that kind of information, what is the natural thing for her to do? She goes to the husband. Hmm. Shall you see? Your evil is catching up with you. 
It is you that you will die. You will not, me, I will not die with my children. And she will cause trouble in the house, but not Abigail. Look at what the Bible says about that woman. Come with me to verse 36. After he had pleaded with David's men and he had given them, he has tried to pacify them and beg them, please don't do this. Forget, leave my husband. She interceded for the husband. That is his assertion. Praying, pleading on behalf of the husband. She did that. Now, she, after she has prayed, she felt I needed to talk to my husband. Come with me to verse 36. And Abigail came to Nabal. And behold, he held a feast in his house. Like the feast of a king, and Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him what? She told him what? Less or more until the morning light. This was a woman that had been praying, pleading, interceding for the husband that the evil that David purposed will not come upon him. Only for him ah, to come to the husband and to say, ah, look at what I have done, look at what I heard. Do. He found a man, partying, drinking. So, eh, another woman would have taken a knife. I know you really want to die. Let me cook, kill you before you die. So, you are here partying. Why me? I am pleading. The Bible says he looked at the man and he said, this is not the right time. Some women would have threw the table upside down. All you men that you are feasting. David has no plan to kill you. You people will not kill my... And she will insult the husband, her friends, and put the husband to a public shame and disgrace. She never did. The Bible says she came here, saw them having a party, and Nabal was drunken to stupor. And the woman just left. A wise woman. She will know when to speak and wrong when to speak. Even though she had a reason... She had a strong case to scold and to rebuke and to challenge the husband. That woman, the Bible says, said nothing to the husband. He said, the time is not right. What can I say to a man that is drunken? Some other women, anytime their husband has gone out to go and drink and they come back, they say, sure, you have finished drinking in the house. In this house, you will not see peace. And they will hold him and they will punch him. They know he's drunken at that time. He has no strength. And they will beat him. Not, not Abigail. The Lord will help us. Look at verse 37. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Naba and his wife had, and his wife had told him this saying that his heart died within him and he became as a stone. She waited till the morning. The alcohol is gone. The, the reality is, you know, confronting him now and he told the husband, look and look and look at the time must be right for you to talk to your husband if you want to change him. You don't talk to him when the fire and the heat is on. In the heat of the moment, just hold your peace. That is wisdom. And I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Godly wisdom is different from worldly wisdom. And that's what we are learning here. Somebody will, adv will adv advise the wife, is that what your husband does? <laughs> I, I, just, I just laugh at you. Oh, is this what you have been putting up with? Let, let me tell you. My husband only shouted on me. I threw his things out. He shouted on me. Only shout to raise his voice at me. That was the last of him. So this is what you are putting up with. I would rather not be married than to put up with this mess. That is worldly counsel. That is worldly wisdom. But hearing is the word of God. Worldly wisdom cannot convert the unsaved husband. Walking in the spirit and producing abundant fruit of the spirit. Loving the husband and caring for that callous individual. And submitting to the inconsiderate husband. They are effective tools that can bring the conversion of that husband in good time. You know what the Bible says that is interesting about that passage that we have read? The Bible says that these men, though they obey not the word, but while beholding your own chaste conversation, coupled with fear. Think about it in the morning. When Nebal came to his senses, and the wife now explained to him 
That look at his chapter in verse 17, what I heard. Chapter 18, 19, 20, all through, look at all that I did. In, in verse 36, I came because I needed to talk to you. And I found you with your friends, drinking and making a, a, a fool of the thing. Even while somebody is planning to wipe out your whole family. Yet I did not talk to you. But I think the atmosphere is right for you. For me, your friends are not there. I didn't cause you embarrassment in the presence of your friend. I didn't, I didn't interrupt your phone because I needed to talk to you. But at least, the man, the Bible says he became a stone. He looked at the wife and he said, oh, what a woman. I pray your husband will be able to say that about you. That even though he will not say it to you, your face, he will, when he goes out to his friend, he will say, look, hmm, all these things, I can't lie to you. I married an angel. My wife is an angel. Is God sent. Can your husband say that about you? And God is telling us, as Christian women, that God expects so much from us, especially when our husband appears to have fallen away, appears not to be living by the dictates of the world. And I'm trusting God that the Lord God of heaven he will change our families for the better in Jesus name. Let Christian graces be always presented through your life before your husband. And your conversation let it be such that it's commendable because that way God is going to use you to change your husband. You remember the story of Hannah. You read in 1 Samuel chapter 1 from verse 32. You see the life of Hannah. The Bible says even, uh, uh, I mean, the, the second wife of the husband always, you know, did things that would make her fret. But that woman held her peace. She was always pleading her cause with the Lord. Always. She, she has no story. She, that man looked at the woman and said, even though you don't have any child for me, you know I give you more gifts than the other one that even has children. You know I have never given up on you. I'm always going to Shiloh with you because you are a woman that I cannot you know I, 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 I mean, what I found in you is much, much more than children. There are times when a woman has not given birth but the husband stays with them because they know that beyond childbearing there is a virtue that goes beyond that. Sometimes you, some women even have children and the husband will still divorce them. Say, I won't put up with this kind of thing. You and your children, take them and go. Because you are not only rebelling against your husband, you are even teaching the children to rebel against their father. Oh, he's not converted, that's fine. He might not be living in the, in the light of God's word, all right. It's not a reason for you not to submit to him. That's what the Bible is saying. The Lord will grant it unto us in Jesus' name. Worldly wisdom is contrary to the total revelation of God's word and will teach vengeance and revenge. But you don't need to do that. The Bible tells us, as we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 13, He says, Avenge not yourself. He says, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. That's what the, God, the word of God says. Your husband is doing this and doing that. Don't fight for yourself. Leave him to God. You just pray. God knows how to deal with him. God knows how to deal with that rebellious man. Do you, do you know what happened in the case of uh, Nabal that we are, we, are, we, are, we are reading about? Let me show you. In verse, 30, we're in verse 36 and in verse 37, he spoke to the husband. Look at what happened immediately in verse 38. And it came to pass about 10 days later after that the Lord did what? The Lord will not kill your husband. No. He won't do that. But in the case of Naba, God look, only God knows how, what that woman has put up with for that long. And woman, the woman just continued to do what she's doing. But eventually, the, that man eventually suffered. Only God knows untimely death. Maybe it was because of his drinking. Maybe it's because, because of anything. And eventually, that woman moved on. 
He, what, what he got through with was that woman that said that I will teach this my husband a lesson. I will do this and do this. The Bible says, leave him for God. If you pray and believe God, God will change him. God knows how to deal with every man. And brethren, is important. When we read the word of God, we read it with understanding. Let's not be cruel. Let's not be wicked. Sometimes you will hear some women, if they tell you, if they, if they, if they ask, you know, they will, some women that if you come another life and you have to marry this man again, will you marry this man? Some women will say, no. God forbid. Because what they have seen, what they have suffered, be married to you. Yeah, that is, it's inconceivable, irreconcilable. Is it your unforgiveness? Is it your uncaring attitude? Is it your neglect? As I'm talking to men this morning, I'm talking to women too. Don't, don't let it be said that you are a man that obey not the word. That you are always doing your, oh, I am the man and I will do what I want to do. It will please me. No. They do that in the world. As a Christian, you don't do that. You don't do that. You come to the point where there is, you know, dialogue. We can talk. You find some men, they will help their family, their own family, their own brothers and their sisters more than they will help the family of their wife. Oh, they feel, oh yes, the first responsibility and duty that I hold is towards my own sibling. You have established three, four people of your brothers in business and your wife's family, they don't have anything. You can't pick one of them and say, let me do something for them too. And the woman lives with you. Serve you. Of course, we are not going to teach that the woman should rebel, but even you yourself, if nobody knows, can't God see you? Even your own conscience will prick you. If your wife cannot look at you and say, oh, thank God for the life of my husband, through him, this my, uh, my, uh, my brother, he was the one that set him up in business. He was the one that sent him to school. He was the one that did this. That they cannot thank, they cannot look at their house and say, I thank God for the life of this my husband. If I had not married this man, I don't know what would have become of my family. If that cannot be said about you as a husband, then you need to go back home and reevaluate your priorities. If you don't have the means, we understand. But if you have the means, and all the help that is coming from you is towards your own parents and towards your own brothers and sisters and your siblings, and never a time have you turned to your in-law and said, in-law, please uh, forgive me all this while. I have been busy taking care of other things. What's the situation? In what way can we help? And you say, okay, at least for this year, I want to focus on my in-law. Oh, that wife is part of that family, just like your, your brothers are part of. In fact, that wife is your first family now, not your, your brothers and your sisters. That's the way God sees it. And I pray the Lord will give us grace. That brings me to the final point. The conversion of the unbelieving spouse. Conviction <clears throat> can take hold of a man in various ways. The soul of Tarsus today may become Paul the Apostle tomorrow that defiant dis, dis, disobedient and deluded spouse can be converted tomorrow but it can happen without the world but as they also without the world be won by the conversation of the wife by the lifestyle of the wife come with me to 1st Corinthians chapter 7 before we go to the Lord in prayer. You know, when, we, when, when, we, when we do marriage, uh, when we teach on marriage, it is always tough, it is always hard. But the truth has to be said. Because every one of us will find ourselves weighed in the balance and found wanting. 
It's not <clears throat> to criticize or to judge. It is rather to you know, reveal our weaknesses and bring us to a place where we want to make corrections and make our families better. And the Lord will do it in Jesus' name. You know, I've always told you that when you are looking for a place of amusement where you can laugh and nobody is going to... You go to the theater. But if you are looking for a place where you want to think... You want to really look, evaluate, look at your life and ever, you come to church. That's why we are doing church. We want to be able to get better in our family life, in our relationship with one another, in our relationship with God. And I pray God will perfect that in our lives in Jesus' name. In First Corinthians chapter 17, as I read here <clears throat> in verse 16, look at the question <clears throat> that the Bible is asking. For what knowest thou, O wife? Whether thou shalt save thy husband. How do you know? If your life will convert your husband. Oh, I can't be bothered. I will do to him what he is doing to me. I will pay him back in, in, in his coin. How do you know that God wants to break down the resistance of that man through your life? And as he sees humility. As he sees meekness. As he sees you know, the, the fruits of repentance in your life. He sees you bear no grudge. Even when you know all his sins, you are still faithful. You are still caring. You are still having fellowship. You are still forgiving. Even before he tells you, I'm sorry about it, was my husband, I know already. The devil is, 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 is in this and God will defeat him in this family. The word you are saying to him, he's looking at you and saying, ah, what a wife. What a wife. I have a lot of inadequacies myself. If I hadn't married my wife, maybe our marriage wouldn't have survived. Because God knows my weaknesses. He knows me. So he gave me a wife to make me fulfill the ministry that he has called me to. And the question is, how far are you helping your husband? That okay, you know God can make use of this, my husband. But now he's not living right. But rather for that, for you to be using somebody else to compare. Can't you see your mates? Can't you see? You come to church every time. You see your mates. They are ministering. They are doing something. You, your life is, is just uh, Continue. You will die and go to hell. You don't say that. You don't say that. That, woman, that man will look at you and say, I will die and go to hell. Yes, I will die and go to hell. But you will not be in this house when I die and go to hell. Since that is your wish. Go, go, just go. Go and look for a righteous man. But do you know that God, in the process of time, he now converts that man. Maybe through <clears throat> another way. And you are seeing that man now is a converted individual. He's a man that has been restored back into fellowship with God. And you are looking at him and you are saying, oh, my husband has changed. It will be to your shame. What knowest thou, O wife, if thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wives? Thy wife. You don't know. Those who seem hardened to gospel preaching from the pulpit may yet come under strong, irresistible conviction and be led to genuine conversion through the gracious, righteous life of the wife. Who live with them. That's why the Bible says, Let your light so shine. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine to your husband, not just to the world. Let your light so shine to your wife that she's seeing that you are considerate, that she's seeing that you are reasonable, that she's seeing that you obey the word. Let your light so shine. Your light is so shining that if they ask your wife, even though she was, no, I don't agree with my husband and everything, on everything, but that my husband, <laughs> he obeys every word of God. Don't go to him. Don't even, go. okay, you don't believe, go and try. He can vouch for you while you are not there. You know you are not living in compromise. Even though you know what they are doing, you are not going to do that. 
Let your light so shine. In First Peter chapter 2, look at that passage with me. Look at what the Bible says. In verse 12. Let me read from verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers, as the uncompromising saints, as genuinely converted people, and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall see, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. In other words, your, your, your spouse is thanking God for your life. Uh, that I almost fell into that trap of compromise. Thank God for my wife. She was the one that says, my husband, we cannot do that. Oh, my, 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 my wife, ah, ah, come on, how can we do that kind of a thing? What will be our testimony? I almost, I almost yielded to that temptation to follow that path. Thank God for my wife. She didn't allow, let your, they are looking at your life and they are thanking God. That's what it should be. And I pray that this will be a reality in every family in Jesus' name. Amen. A man may argue against the spoken word, but there's no argument against a transformed life that confronts him every moment of the day. You can disagree with some things, that, but you can't disagree. When your husband, your wife is genuinely born again, and you will see her, she observes her quiet time. Her devotion is constant. Her prayer life is regular. Righteousness and holiness is, oh, is, is, is unpeckable. Every time you come back, you know that. Uh, you can't even think about it, that I'm looking for money. And I, the first person I thought is that, hmm, hmm, I know the rat in this house. It, it must be my wife. Far from it, because you know your wife will not steal. Something is wrong in the house, and they have told the story outside. You, you know, no, no, no. I have not heard the old story, but I, I, no, no, I know my wife. That's what should be happening. You cannot dispute that because you are seeing it on daily basis in your relationship, in your conversation, in your discussion. You are seeing this thing: your wife, your husband, living like a child of God. The greatest spiritual weapon of the Christian for the conversion of the unrepentant spouse is the godly life with intercessory prayer. It is very, very important. The Christian wife and husband can be used of God for the conversion of an unbelieving spouse if they will obey the Lord consistently in all things and graciously submit themselves and love their husband at home. Love your husband. Love your wife. He is not born again. He is backsliding. But yet, he is still, he is still, he is still a child of God. At least he, he is still a creature of God. God created him. Because the Bible says, oh, if your, if your, if your, if your enemy hunger, feed him, Abby. If you are going to feed your enemies. Your husband is not yet your enemy, at least. He's not just unconverted. He has not become an enemy yet. But the Bible is saying that even an enemy, when he's hungry, feed him. So why should you be, behave differently to your husband or to your spouse that is not converted? Oh, my wife is not living right. And I have given my life to the Lord. And as the man in this house, she will not see my face until she has come, she has agreed to live for the Lord. It's by fire, by force. No. You don't have that power to convert anybody. It is God. In your submission as a wife or as a husband, in your loving your husband or your wife that is not converted, you cannot and you must not sin. Oh, I will obey, I will submit my, to my husband, but understand when it leads to sin you must not do it as i conclude you know some of the things that we are, that happens in africa or in some places 
where, uh, you know, maybe because the husband has some problems and he cannot give birth, and some husband will tell the wife, look, uh, we need to take care of this problem to cover the public shame. And you, you can go and get uh, preg- impregnated outside. Just don't let me know. You know, I just don't want to know about it. And the husband is telling you like that. An unbelieving husband. You as a wife, you are not going to do that. You tell the husband, no, 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 no. Come on, my husband. God will bless us with children. I don't care about the shame. I can't bring myself to go and do that. Because some men, they do it. They come as a surprise, but it's happening. So in your loving, in your submitting to your husband, you cannot sin. You cannot compromise God's truth or deny the faith. Remember the story in Genesis. When Rachel came to Jacob, give me a, ch- a child or I die. <laughs> Jacob said, ah, you want to die? Uh, maybe, well, I won't tell you to die, but let me just tell you I am not God. That's what you should be doing. Even Jacob, in the Old Testament, looked at the wife, am I God? Don't tell me, don't tell me I must give you a child by all means. That individual stood his ground. And when it comes to things that contradict the word of God, you need to stand your ground. Oh, I love you, my husband. I submit myself to you, my husband. But not when it comes to this. Because I have my soul to keep. When sin is not involved, the Bible expects that we will submit love and give God the chance to walk out the salvation of our husband. This is the only part to building a home, a church, a community, and a nation that God wants. And I pray that in this our church, we won't turn back on this part in Jesus' name. We will continue to encourage ourselves. We will continue to challenge ourselves. So that when life is over, God will see that at least as best as we could, we live according to his word. And I pray that happy home where there is love and fellowship and blessing, the Lord will grant unto each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Let's rise up on our feet as we talk to the Lord in prayer.